Good morning. Um, so we'll talk about um, variant calling. As usual, relative common sense. So my first lecture will be on the small variant calling. So um, mainly focus on um, SNV and uh, so SNP and inverse. As I so what the learning objective of the class. So to give you an overview of. Uh, how we can do the variant calling and what to, how we process uh, to understand the basic principle of uh, that process uh, to know how when you have done your variant calling how you can improve it so before doing it after doing it how to filter annotate your variants and so to be able to call the variants and to learn about the form the format and at the end we will. Uh, give a little um, insight about how to visualize um, the variant. As I say uh, yesterday, I will do a small uh, shameless advertisement. Compute Canada, my, our partner, as I say, a lot of, if you are Canadian, academic, you have access to all these um, uh, CPUs and all these clusters for free, so it's really, um, it's really interesting uh, and it uh, saves us a lot of money. So we have a good partnership with them. Um, especially, we maintain uh, t the tools, the bioinformatics tools of the Compute Canada. So almost more than no more than ninety tools. Uh, we maintain the dynamic uh, resources. So fourteen spaces that are available, twenty different builds, and we provi provide pipeline for analysis. So it's six. It's uh, outdated. Now we are at um, at um, uh, eight uh, pipelines. So. Among this, um, the, the other one that is missing is the one for the tumor an analysis of a tumor normal pair and the 16S metagenomic analysis. Uh, so if you are interested to see, this is the pipeline and this is our um, uh, repository for the pipeline. Um, we are also part of the GenApp consortium. Uh, so GenApp is kind of an, an, a hub that tries to link all this kind of stuff. So it gives access to pipeline, but it gives access to um, private general browser, to um, ga uh, private galaxies that run on a Compute Canada server, and you can build your own project, put your data on um, Compute Canada, and everything will run, and you could manage that. So it's really uh, interesting if you are um, Canadian. If not, you need to come back to see. You need to come to see us uh, migrate to Canada. More seriously, uh, no. Uh, what we will talk today is about um, variant calling. So why people do variant calling? It's, uh, because they want to know the genetic variation and structural var um, variation across individuals. Or people are interested in, in uh, genetic variation when they study cancer, when they do uh, agri agricultural, and a lot of other uh, type of um, reason you want to to analyze. Um, your data to find variants. So what is what is our um, workflow to do that? Um, so three main um, three main steps in the workflow: the data processing that we have uh, seen yesterday, the variant discovery, and the variant refinement. So when you do the variant discovery, depending on how many samples you have at the time, you could do it, or as if you have many samples, you could by single uh, variant, single calling, so by by individual sample or Joining all your sample. Then as for um, as for each step, when you generate your, your variant, usually you filter your variant to improve uh, your data. And then what we do usually we do a functional annotation. We also uh, compare our uh, variants through control databases. And then we have a final variant evaluation. So either first on IGV to see if variant looks real on IGV, and if they looks real, we I uh, usually um, uh, validate the interesting variant through Sanger sequencing. Um, this is done mainly for uh, classical DNS pipeline because Sanger sequencing uh, is not working well when you work on cancer if you have um, a low fraction of DNA that contain your variant. So if you have um, clonality uh, or uh, cellularity, Sanger sequencing is not the best method to do to the validation. So in that case, we go more with high coverage um, or orthogonal sequencing method. So, the summary, what we've done yesterday. Today, we'll talk about the small variant calling, stick on Indel and how we can filter, and tomorrow, and uh, later this afternoon, on, um, on the 
structural variant and um, copy number variation. As I explained yesterday, um, when you have your data, it's really, really important to think about the quality of my data. So it's really important to look at your data and uh, to be sure that your data are good and to be confident on your data. Otherwise, you will always have a kind of uh, a dot in your mind saying, okay, uh, is what I'm seeing true or not? Um, so some uh, tips for your quality control that we already saw yesterday, but um, what is really, really important for variant coding is to be uh, sure that all the samples have been processed the same way. So same library, same protocol, same type of instrument. Otherwise, each technology could bring its own artifact. And if you have like 10% of your variants that have sequence on another library or another um, sequencer or processed through another pipeline, you could have 10% of variants that will appear on your cohort. And you say, oh, yeah, it's fine. But instead, it's just your technology. Um, so this is really important, not at the individual level, but when you want to compare things and when you want to have more high level comparison of your, of your variant. So when we do SMB coding, uh, what we call SMB coding usually is look at indels, but mostly because indel is quite complicated and still not a good, there's still no good method to do it, but most people are looking at uh, SMB, at SNP, sorry. Uh, so SNPs is the position of the genomes where on, your, on the reference genome you have a given um, a basis and on the, your sample genomes you have another basis or variant basis. So what is the goal of the uh, SNP discovery? So it's to make difference, it's to make the difference between this kind of position where we have a SNP with this kind of position where we have sequencing error. So, as you can see, uh, the, main, uh, the main parameters that will lead you to make the difference between this different type of position of the sequencing error and the SNP is a good base quality to be sure that you are looking at it, to, to try to, uh, uh, to uh, lower the number of sequencing error, but also uh, sufficient depth of coverage, to, because if I have only three X of coverage, like if I take this last three uh, uh, line on the, on, 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 the, on the chart here, you can see I cannot, be, I cannot differentiate which one is a, a real variant. So depth of coverage is good. And uh, an accurate mapping. That's why yesterday I spent a lot of time to uh, try to show you what's the main point of doing um, alignment and refinement. And I will represent that today too. So base quality, we'll talk yesterday. So I don't need to give more details. On that. So, uh, just to give you uh, an idea, when you see a variance, uh, where this is two, two cases where you have a high quality of your data, a low quality of your data, clearly this one I will be more um, confident to call a variance there if I have enough coverage. And here, where I know that base quality is bad, and I know this other base quality is bad in the other reads, so I'm not sure what I'm seeing. So, really, it's important to have a high quality and to remove the, the, the low quality basis. So just to give you an idea of the work that we used to do the SNP calling, so we, uh, we have the processing of the data, so the counter provides you uh, um, data in, in terms of images of each cycle. So you generate your, you do the base calling, you generate the past view, you do your read mapping. Really important, you refine your uh, mapping, and then you have as I say, two possibilities. As you can do single sample calling, so each sample individually. So in that cases, you, what you will do, you will find a location where you have SNP and genotype your SNP at the same time. Uh, so this type of approach is using Bayesian methods. Uh, if, you have, if you have really high uh, level of coverage, like more than uh, 100x of coverage, some methods switch from Bayesian to a Strizal approach because it's, um, it's more faster to do that. So Strizal is just tell, telling you you choose a, a, a given threshold like 20% and 80%, and if you have a read variant count between 20 and, and 80% and 80%, you, you are calling heterozygote. If you have more than 80, you are calling a homozygote variant. Less than 20, you're calling a homozygote uh, reference. 
or some uh, other methods are using t-test approach, but this one are more when you compare um, just normal and tumor. So t-test is used more to, to say, is what I'm saying, what I see in my tumor is in terms of read variant count different from what I see in my normal uh, sample. So this is one method, but if you have a multiple sample, which is uh, quite often the case, uh, it's really recommended to go uh, to, to, to process, uh, to do the variant calling through multi-sample calling. So um, in this case, it's a two-step method. So the first step, uh, it's a Bayesian approach where you, you take the information from every sample. And what you are doing in this, in this uh, step, you just try to find position where there could be in whatever sample a SNP. So you just find position and uh, this step just for each position just provide um, uh, posterior um, um, probabilities and from these posterior probabilities after, after that you do a maximum that you would estimate in each sample to do the genotyping. So you use the, the, the main point and the, and the strength of this information is to determine the position of the possible position or the target candidate position of each uh, SNP using the information of everybody, so you have a lot of information to, to find that, and then you do your genotyping. SNP calling. So I'll tell you that uh, to do that, we use Bayesian approach. So as a rule of thumb, I try to don't put a lot of equations, so I will not go into details, but you have it if you want. But just to give you an idea, um, what is uh, uh, um, the SNP calling uh, problem is a way to find the probability that you have a genotype um, knowing you have a specific set of data. So, I'm not going to the detail, but it's mainly best to look at the probability of your uh, data based on which haplotypes you can, you can have, knowing each, of, each possible haplotype. And this probability is related to what you observe the data based on each uh, um, base you can observe and each, each base quality. So we only uh, we always come back to base quality as a major um, important parameter on your data. So as I said, it's really uh, we're not going detail in, in this formula, but because every color has its own formula on Bayesian approach to do that. So uh, I will not cannot give you the detail of everything, but um, usually so. Best quality is, is really important and I say your alignment. So the strategy to um, improve your variant coding, as we saw yesterday, three of them, is to do a different type of, um, of uh, process. Local realignment, uh, marking duplicates, best quality recalibration, and also uh, the new ones that we didn't see yet, population structure and imputation. Local realignment, really fast, we saw here. Uh, when you have this kind of pattern where you have a mix of indels and SNPs on the same uh, proximity, uh, you can do realignment of your read to, to see if uh, the SNP are not false positive because uh, aligner tend to favor the SNP instead of uh, indel. Uh, just to let you know, uh, if you are um, if you have issue with time of processing, some um, aligner know. Uh, we do this uh, um, uh, recal uh, realignment, local realignment step during uh, the variant calling. So if you use appetite color from JTK, that was the one we'll use today, uh, it's not necessary, it's not mandatory to do the, um, the local realignment because it will redo for each position. If finds there's a SNP, it will uh, realign the, um, the variant. Second so is mark marking duplicates. So we saw yesterday how to do that. But here it's just to give you more an idea of what the impact of duplicates when you do your variant calling. So you can imagine you've got this uh, variant, this uh, read here that is a duplicate. And unfortunately, during the first uh, cycle of PCR, the, in the library, you, you generate a sequencing error. So if you don't mark the duplicates, if you don't count this as a duplicate, you will see that at this position, almost 60% uh, of, uh, of my reads shows this uh, variance. But then if I mark the duplicate only less than one, only one third, so you can clearly go with a, a position where you will have probably a, a, a strong call of a variance, where here you will have probably 
and it's a no call or a call with a, a low um, a low quality or uncommon quality. Let's quality recalibration we talked yesterday. It's just to and I saw you in the way the variants are calling, they use the best quality as a, as a, as a source of the um, variant color. So it's really good to uh, have the, not the, the, original, um, the original best quality, but the ones that are uh, re, um, recalibrated based on the, on the context, on the dynamic context and on the cycle, in order to avoid um, errors. So now the, the way to improve Orion calling that I didn't talk yesterday is the family or the population structure and the imputation. So first imputation. Uh, so imputation, the, the, the way we work is, is now that we have a lot of um, a lot of consortiums that uh, are sequence and genotype thousands and thousands of, uh, of uh, genomes. Um, if you are working with samples that get to the same uh, population, the idea is why don't you use the information of the other uh, sequencing to improve your run call. So for example, you know that you look at the population and you know that in, the, in a specific region you have these two haplotypes. And in your data you have, you have not so good coverage, not so good quality because you have used other methods and you face this problem. So you have this, you know, you see this uh, to uh, variant, but you're not able to know what is the, the value of the possible SNP at this position. So what you can do with imputation, you can go back to the population and say, okay, uh, probably have uh, high probability that the variant at this position is that the principle of imputation. It's not that easy, but it's uh, the principle behind the imputation. You three weight I don't know, the example you've given the. the So yeah. The probability of recombination is extremely low, but how do you put in some kind of weighted model for the distance between the known SNPs and imputing the internal SNP based on recombination? Yeah, so you need to you, you have to, to put in your models the, the distance and the linkage this kilogram between the different positions. So because you know so imputation, if you have a lot of samples, some of them will probably be uh, if, uh, assigned differently. Depending on the leakage, if you are only like 80% uh, uh, of your allele, like that, and if you have other combinations, it will have a kind of probabilistic choice for its sample. So it's not 100% sure. In that case, when you have two alleles, it's 100% sure. But sometimes imputation could be wrong. As I say, uh, important when you have a population of data to do the multi sample. So it was an old, old, old um, uh, an old um, a slide, so it's from 2011. Uh, so not all these uh, color are, not, are still available on the, on the, for for doing the calling, but it was interesting to see that at this time already, when when people start to think about uh, populations, that they compare sample with multiple uh, with single coding, multiple coding, and the one which do multiple and imputation, and we saw that accuracy is quite better when you use the population information. Another really good way to improve your variance is if you have a family structure. For example, if you have trio, it's uh, really a good information because usually when you do trio, it's not well designed, you are more interested in the child and the type. And you know that what you see in the sound come from half to the to one parent and half to the other parent. So what you see in the child uh, in the in the child for almost every variant, not for all, but for almost every variant, uh, the information is duplicated in the parent. So you have more reads to, to confirm your uh, your call. Uh, and then when you do a call, you all, you can also use uh, a Mendelian segregation of alleles. So if I see uh, a mosaicot uh, variant here but if I see this one is um, homozygote or heterozygote, and this one is homozygote uh, reference, it's not possible, except if you have a de novo mutation. So. And the de novo mutation rate is something that people are interested in, so you can also uh, type that information from TRIO. So it's really interesting to, to, have the, to work with TRIO. Just to give you an idea of what it takes, so BAMFAL, usually for world, for, um, world genome sequencing, around 200 gigabytes. And you switch from that BAM file to a 
uh, raw variant files to OBCF, which is around one gigabyte for whole genome um, analysis. Way, um, way less bigger if you do a snip, a snip um, a ca a capture like exam, a world exam. And to do the processing, it takes around 10 hours for a uh, world genome. So now, what we do with uh, this variant, when we have called them. Uh, first, the, the type of data where you will receive your variant is uh, VCF. Just upon the type of data, the VCF data, the VCF format is really the standard for um, the SNB. Uh, it's not, some people push to, have to use this standard for SV, some of them not. I'm part of people that uh, think that uh, VCF is not a good format for structural variant, but it's kind of a, a debate in the, in, in the field. But for uh, SNV, it's a really good, uh, it's a really good uh, format. So it's composed in two, um, two parts. The first part, the header here, which has two mandatory uh, lines, one which tells you which uh, version of VCF you are using, and one describing each uh, columns. And you've got all this bunch of information, but now almost every color gives you all this uh, information. So what this uh, line um, uh, correspond to, this line correspond to information and to describe what information will be given in that columns and what information in the format will be given for each of the uh, genotypes. So the format is you have chromosome position, ID of the SNP if you have it, if you don't have it or if you didn't try to look for the ID, you will have a dot, reference alleles, alternate alleles, quality of the, um, so it's a quality score, it's a FRED score, quality of the call. If you uh, filter your data, if you, if you apply some filter, if it's passed or didn't pass the filter, and the info field and the format. So info field, uh, usually DP, for example, DP here, you can see is the total depth at the position. So all the, all the field are specific to each color, and all the field most of the time will be uh, described here. Format, as I tell you, the format column are separated by the, uh, the, co the column, and uh, most of the time you will you will have the GT and the DP field in that um, in that uh, in in this column, but after each color. Uh, set the different parameter as you want. So the GT will be the genotype and the DP will be the depth. So here we can see that the genotype is given by 0, uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, so it gives you, inter um, like that, it tells you I'm um, heterozygote here. So when we want to do uh, variant filtering, um, so when you do Whatever the color you choose, you will have a lot of false positive. So the idea is to uh, to filter this false positive. So there are two um, ways to do that, and usually people uh, do both. But um, one is more complicated to well, one is more complicated than the other, and uh, one uh, asks more uh, background knowledge. So you can do a manual filtering based on uh, different parameters uh, using uh, GTK or SNPSIF. And what you do is to, uh, you know your data, you know how you've called, you know what you've experimented. So you decide, okay, uh, based on given quality score, based on this uh, level of coverage, so you apply some parameters to tell you what I expect to be the parameter of a good variant. So, it's difficult uh, because you need to know exactly what you are doing, you need to know exactly um, what parameters are important, so you need to have expertise to do, to do that. But it's really efficient and fast. Uh, so, so now people are doing more what we call variant recalibration. Um, so the, the idea is to, uh, to do, I will go in detail, more in detail, uh, uh, of that, but the idea is to um, take uh, information of um, population variant to select set of variants and to learn 
some um, specific parameter to good variant and to apply these parameters, these results that are learned uh, automatically uh, to uh, all the variant and to remove some of the variant. So this could be done, the variant recalibration, when you have a lot of sample, because it's a, it's a machine learning process. Uh, so at least you need to have 10, 5 to 10 variant, 5 to 10 sample to, do, to uh, work. You can run the command, but most of the time, if you don't have enough variants, the command of GTK will fail and tell you I don't have enough variants. So today, as we are a small region with a small sample, we won't do it. Um, so also, you can use and annotate your variants uh, using uh, known uh, databases. In so the heart map, the DBSNP. So the idea is to use this variant to try to uh, uh, find which are the possible false negative and false positives. So app map is good quality, so you don't have so much variant, but you know that this variant has been extremely worked and validated. And in DBSNP, you know it's a little bit everything. So it's kind of, it's more, it's more free. So I say the variant uh, recalibration, how it works. Uh, more in, in detail, so what you, what you do, you take your, you take your um, variant set, you, te you take a, a set of validated variants, where well, you know that are highly uh, validated, and so which, may, which should be the truth. And what you do, you randomly select a subset of variants uh, in your data that are fine in this set of variants that you know are of good quality. So you define it's a, your training set. So when you have this call set, you will learn how what, what are the rules and what are the different uh, value of the different parameters that have been uh, the value of these parameters to uh, recognize the variants. So your call set the variants that are good and the variants that are bad. That, that are bad. Then you apply the rule to all the sites. So you, you, you can you give a score to all the variants, whatever they are, they are or they are not in your call set. And then you tell him a sensitivity result you want in your call. Like, I want 99% sensitivity. So in your call set, what are the parameters that makes me 99% uh, sensitivity based on the known variant? So that defines your result, your result. And when you have defined this result, you apply it to the rest of the, of the variant. Then when you have to do that, what you do, as I say, you uh, usually um, annotate your uh, variants. Um, what is important to annotate is the mappability. So is my variant in a region where I know it's hard to map reads? So you have to, we, we have track to, uh, to, to measure that uh, parameters. So if you are in a, in a region that you know there's uh, low mappability probably that could be an issue in your, in your variant and you, this variant is uh, probably uh, not really, you cannot be too, really confident. Uh, you can use DBSNP to see if the variant have already been um, uh, uh, reported. Uh, you can predict the effect of your variant, so tool like SNPF, VEP or ANOVAR can be used, so the idea is just to, when you have a variant, and if the variants uh, overlap with the transcript, where, where the variant uh, found in, where the variant is located in the transcript, and what the um, the, the variant allele uh, have uh, as impact in terms of uh, the protein. So, what can amino acid? What, is there an amino acid change? Is there uh, like a, uh, a, for the, for indel? Is there a frame shift on your on your protein? DBNFCP is another database you could use to annotate for the, for the change. So DBNFCP is just a database that shows that this variant has been reported in all the tools to do uh, annotation as, so for non variants as changing this kind, of, uh, this kind of function in your protein. If you work on cancer, usually you can use uh, COSMIC, uh, where COSMIC reports the um, somatic mutation instead of mutation. So it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, we're talking yesterday, they're exact, there are also, also a lot of other databases you can use, but it's just to give you an idea of what you can do to annotate your variants. Today we'll use SNPF to do the annotation. Um, so uh, how it does, it uses the reference genome, you get the um, ensemble uh, transcript and it calculates the effect. So first it looks 
if your variant is in uh, intergenic uh, region. If it's intergenic, it's look if it's close to um, a transcription factor binding site, or if it's really like in, a, in somewhere that we don't have any information. And then if it's not intergenic, it's go, it, we are in the coding region. In that, case, in that case, it will look what the different uh, type that your variants um, will create on the transcript. Based on that, uh, it will allow you to, it will annotate for each of the transcripts that is overlapping your variants. So if you have like five transcripts, you will have five annotations for these variants, which are, which will be displayed from the highest to the lowest impact. We tell you if the impact is high, moderate, low, or just modifier. So usually when we do analysis um, uh, at the center, when we have a list of variants and we annotate them, uh, we then split the, the, the group of variants in two, the high and moderate impact and the uh, low and modifier impact. So and we start to work with the high and moderate and we don't find anything interesting. We start to dig with low and modifier. You can do also many other things, many annotations. So SNPF is a really, uh, really good tool. So just to let you know, um, it takes 10 hours to, um, to generate the variant. It takes less than one hour to do the filtering and the annotation. But making sense of it could take days, weeks, months, whatever, because it's based on how you can interpret the data. Just to finish, some add-on. Uh, we see that yesterday. IGV. Uh, so when you open a VCF file in IGV, so you can open your VCF file in IGV, what you will have, you will have a summary of the call here, so which display how many, uh, the proportion of samples that are showing um, variants in the position, and then you will you have the uh, report by sample, and then if you have, so you can imagine you can cut there, and then you could have your uh, the display of your file. As usual, uh, when uh, we do uh, variant coding, when we do every, every step, uh, it's important to take uh, metrics, uh, so to collect the metrics, so the metrics of the sequencing, but also the metrics of the, of the variant. So SNPF provides you um, this kind of statistics. Uh, this is interesting. For example, here it just gives you a display um, of which type of region uh, uh, contains the variants. So most of the variations are in the intron, but you see some of the inzone, so in the ETL, downstream, intergenic, so you can have a, a kind of view of your data. The frequency is the number of base change from one to the other, the uh, trans transition to the version ratio, and uh, the display by uh, type of, uh, type of, um, of variants. I think that's it. So. Is this usual to get like so many variants in the intron regions compared to the same Yeah. Uh, why is that? It's uh, because uh, in uh, the intron uh, you don't have such a um, selection pressure and impact. So when you have a, when you have a variant in your uh, in your uh, exon, uh, they need to they will, be, uh, they will have a selec selective pressure. To keep it or not, depending on if they provide an advantage or is it. With Nexon, I get it. I, I, I mean intergenic versus intron. Yeah, but it, in because in the intron, you don't have a functional impact. Except, <laughs> except if it's like modifier, splicing modifier at the edges of the intron, but if in the middle of the intron, if you have a, a variant, have because it will be the, the intron will be edited at the terminal level, mm -hmm. so you have really less um, uh, pressure. Station pressure on your other parts.